Oh boy, I hope you guys enjoy RPGs, because if not, this is going to be one long ass video. Okay, who am I kidding? This video is just long regardless. But if I were to ask you which company comes to mind when considering RPGs, I don't think many answers would surprise me. And yes, that goes for those trying to think outside the box here. But for the majority of us, there's probably no other game company in the world that dominates a specific genre as much as Square Enix does with RPGs. Now some of you may not agree with that kind of statement and that's completely fine, but even the biggest Square Enix haters can't undermine their impact on the genre within the gaming ecosystem. But while Square Enix holds the RPG genre by the balls, this hasn't stopped them from copying a light feel from some other genres, like fighting games, platformers, action games, and even some shooters. There's probably a better analogy to use there, but it's too late now. Regardless, we'll be going through and discussing each and every one of them. Now, as I do with all the videos in this series, I will be placing them in a list that I must stress is not a tier list, nor is it based on how good I think the franchises are. They're merely placed based on how they're doing currently as a franchise. I should also mention that only franchises with more than one game will be discussed, and they must have been released in the West at some point. Now, without further ado, oh wait, hold on, let's wait our turn here. Alright, as I was saying, without further ado, let's find out the current state of every Square Enix franchise. Now when it comes to Square Enix's origins, their name should be a dead giveaway. Because it's not a single word like Nintendo, Sega, or Capcom, it must mean that they're a merged company, just like Bandai Namco, right? Okay, obviously that has no relation to whether or not a company is merged, but in this case, it holds true. The first of these two companies started all the way back in 1975, when founder Yasuhiro Fukushima, an architect turned business entrepreneur, started a publishing company called Aidan Boshu Service Center, which focused on advertising tabloids for real estate. After failing to find a solid foothold here, Fukushima switched tactics and instead looked to invest in the emerging video game market. It was around this point that the company would take on the name Enix Corporation, which was a play on both the mythical Phoenix, as well as an early computer known as the ENIAC. From here, Fukushima would host a competition dubbed the Enix Game hobby program contest, where contestants would show off game prototypes, with the winners being awarded a prize of 1 million yen as well as having their game published by Enix. It was kind of a give and take relationship. Upcoming developers and artists could have their games published while being paid for it, and Enix could build their name in the very new but thriving gaming industry. In fact, it was through this very competition that the likes of Yuji Hori and Koichi Nakamura were discovered, having won the competition with their own games Love Match Tennis and Door Door. Now some of you may be wondering why I've singled these two out, and the reason I did was because following discussions surrounding a port of another game that they had already worked on. Discussions began regarding the idea of developing their very own role-playing game. During the development of this particular game, they would be joined by composer Koichi Sugiyama, and then by Akira Toriyama, the artist of the very popular Dragon Ball series, who would work on the game's art direction and design. The name of the game these legends were working on came to be known as Dragon Quest. A few years prior to this in 1983, another company known simply as Square had been established as a software subsidiary of Den Yusha, an electric power conglomerate led by Kenichi Miyamoto. His son, Masafumi Miyamoto, had no interest in following after his father, and instead found himself drawn towards the development of video games. The following years saw Miyamoto offering jobs to exceptional programmers, writers, and graphic designers, who would go on to develop many of Square's earlier titles. In 1986, Miyamoto broke off Square from its parent company, and moved with a small team down to Ginza, which had been noted as one of the most expensive areas to operate from. The high cost of rent in the area, paired with the numerous commercial fails they'd been putting out, put the company in a very tight position, leading Miyamoto to gather the company four directors and asked for game proposals. Out of the many suggestions, there was one in particular that had been proposed by Sakaguchi that caught everyone's eye. Funnily enough, upon witnessing the success of Enix's Dragon Quest, Sakaguchi proposed that the team work on their very own RPG. And despite some pushback from Miyamoto initially, production began on what would eventually become known as Final Fantasy. Now you've most likely heard of these two games. They were essentially the breakout hits that cemented both Enix and Square's names in gaming history, and to this day have remained each company's flagship franchise. That isn't to say they were the only game series developed by them. Both companies would go on to develop numerous fan favorite series, all of which we will get to throughout this video. During this period though, Enix and Square were essentially rivals, both vying for a spot atop the gaming industry as the king of RPGs. But as the famous saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them. 
Discussions regarding a merger between the two had begun as early as the year 2000, but following the commercial failure of Square's first movie, Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, Enix actually pulled back for a bit, not wanting to risk a merger with a company that was now experiencing its second year straight of financial losses. Thankfully, Square managed to survive with the help of Sony, allowing them to develop and publish more games, which in turn proved successful enough to stabilise their finances. It was at this point that Square's president, Yoichi Wada, stated that the merger would be going ahead, and just like that, on the 1st of April 2003, Square Enix was born. Alright, now that we've discussed how Square Enix came to be, let's spend the next 10 minutes talking about franchise of another company, Taito. Wait, hold on, isn't this a video about Square Enix franchises? I hear you asking. And yes, you're correct. The mention of yet another company may sound strange, but Taito, despite its influence during the earlier days of arcade gaming, did in fact get purchased by Square Enix in 2005, becoming a wholly owned subsidiary by 2006. This means that all of their old IPs are now property of Square Enix, and it's here where we'll begin. Now before being purchased by Square Enix, Taito was at the forefront of the gaming industry, crafting some of the most influential arcade games of the time, some of which single-handedly carried the industry to the point of stardom. The first of these games which also became its own franchise was Speed Race, which was released all the way back in 1974. The goal of Speed Race was simple, players would navigate a car using the attached steering wheel alongside a fast scrolling road. On this road were other cars that players had to avoid, and doing so would grant them points, with more points being awarded the faster you were driving. Now despite its apparent simplicity, this was a huge deal back then, and the game went on to become a worldwide hit. The hardware used to play this game was so complex that Taito released Speed Race at a price point of 100 yen per play. Now while this may just sound like some arbitrary number, its significance comes into play when you realise that before Speed Race, the standard arcade game only cost 50 yen to play. Due to its popularity though, Speed Race seemingly shifted this amount to 100 yen per play. Wheels and Wheels 2, which were the North American iterations of the same series, would go on to sell over 10,000 arcade units, making it the best-selling game of 1975. This success led to the production of countless sequels, variations, and updates over the next decade, ending with Super Speed Race 64, which was released back in 1998. Unfortunately, this means that it's most likely a dead franchise by today's standards, but no one can deny the impact and influence it had during its peak. Now despite the success of Speed Race, Taito weren't done yet, not even close, and if we're talking influence and impact in the gaming scene, then very few, if any, can top what Taito had in store next. Using Atari's breakout hit, fittingly named, well, Breakout, as the blueprint alongside science fiction narratives derived from media such as Star Wars and space battleship Yamato, designer Tomohiro Nishikado set out to develop one of the most ambitious games of its time, with them having to design custom hardware and development tools just to get it running. The final product would feature rows of pixelated aliens and a moving laser cannon. The name of this game was Space Invaders with the goal being to continuously shoot down the rows of aliens, with each clearance bringing in another wave that not only started lower, but moved slightly faster. Now like many early arcade games, Space Invaders doesn't end, and will continue on indefinitely. Now to say this game was successful would be like saying this YouTube channel makes mediocre content. In other words, a massive understatement. As I mentioned earlier, this game single-handedly ushered in the golden age of arcade games, and is often considered one of the most influential video games of all time. By 1982, barely four years after its release, it had already shipped out over 750,000 cabinets and grossed $3.8 billion, making it not only the best-selling video game, but also the highest-grossing video game of all time. To help put those numbers into perspective, it's been stated that whole arcades were dedicated and stocked nothing but Space Invader cabinets, and that the game saw over 8 million daily players in Japan alone, which even by today's standards would make for an extremely successful and active gaming community, let alone back in the awakening stage of the industry. The franchise has expanded to include countless remakes, sequels, and spin-offs, the latest of which being Space Invaders World Defense, which was actually released earlier this year and incorporates AR core geospatial API technology to allow for immersive gaming. Now I say this in quotation marks because let's be real, this is about as immersive as eating ramen while watching, I don't know, Naruto eat ramen. Like it's it's not immersive at all is what I'm trying to say. Regardless, as was the case with Speed Race, no one can deny the influence Space Invaders had on the gaming industry. When you have legends like Shigeru Miyamoto, Hideo Kojima, and John Romero referencing it as their introduction to video games, you know it's a big deal. I think due to its legacy, and because it's still being released somewhat frequently even to this day, Space Invaders has to hold a spot in the flagship tier.
Following up after such a monumental title was never going to be easy, but that wouldn't stop husband and wife team Randy and Sandy, who would go on to develop Kicks, a unique puzzle game that was released back in 1981. Now despite how it looks, the game was fairly simple. Essentially players were tasked with filling up parts of the territory by drawing lines that made up closed shapes. The cabinet came with a four direction joystick, as well as two buttons allowing for both a slow draw and a fast draw. The slow draw would be marked with a different colour and also awarded double points. The titular character Kicks, who was the geometric figure, would move around the space randomly, and should it collide with the player's marker, the player would lose a life. Now in order to complete a level, players would have to claim 75% of the playfield, with subsequent levels increasing the number of kicks that must be avoided. Now while it wasn't as popular as Taito's Space Invaders, the game was said to be a commercial success, exceeding Taito's expectations and quickly rising to become one of the most popular titles of the year. Numerous sequels, ports and clones would follow, ending with Kicks Plus Plus which was released for Xbox Live in 2009. Unfortunately, following this release, the franchise has entered a drought period, one that I don't see ending anytime soon, if ever. Coming into 1982, Taito was laxer on their creativity, and instead released Birdie King, a set of golf arcade games that were released between 1982 and 1984. These games were your typical table arcade units, and were very simplistic in nature. Despite being decently popular for the time, the franchise wouldn't see a new release following Birdie King in 1984, meaning this is yet another dead franchise. Now Taito would follow up Birdie King with Elevator Action, a series of platform shooters that were first released back in 1983. Players would assume the role of Agent 17, codenamed Otto, as he enters a 30 story building from the rooftops. The goal was to get Otto down to the basement floor while collecting all the secret documents hidden behind the red doors. Players would do this by using the building's elevators and escalator systems, or while killing or avoiding enemy agents on each floor. Some of the more interesting features in this game are the sections where the lights go out, adding an extra layer of difficulty to the experience. Much like Kicks, elevator action would go on to become a commercial success, exceeding Taito's expectations once again. The franchise would spawn numerous sequels with Elevator Action Returns and Elevator Action EX, all the way up to Elevator Action Invasion, which was actually released recently in arcades back in 2021. Now due to this recent release, it's only fair that it's placed within the It Exists tier, as it's very clearly a franchise Square Enix still remembers to some extent. Now funnily enough, despite Square coming into existence nearly a decade after Enix, they were the first of the two to start a franchise. I should iterate this means a series of games and not the first one to develop a single game. I know I said I was wasn't going to mention games that were only released in Japan and not the West, but I felt in this case it was warranted as this was the first game ever developed by Square. The game went by the name The Death Trap and was a silent text parser adventure game, where players would issue command lines through their own input as a means to progress through the game. Unlike many text adventures at the time, The Death Trap provided graphical feedback through full screen still images, instead of just relying on text for the output. Now while the game garnered few impressions upon its release, it must have been successful enough as Square would push out a further two sequels in the following years ending with Alpha in 1986, which interestingly now followed a female protagonist while adding a touch of Eroge, which if you don't know what that is, it's just, it's, let's just say fan service. This would end up being Square's last text adventure game, and outside of a few re-releases, the series unfortunately has to join the dead tier. Now Enix must have heard that slight dig I gave them just before, as a year later in 1985, development began on a game that would go on to lay the foundation of an entire franchise. The original Dragon Quest would be released a year later in 1986, and have players take on the role of a hero, who was tasked with retrieving a sacred artifact that had been stolen by an evil warlord. By today's standards, the original game was very simplistic. The game had players exploring open fields, while using Tantatel Castle as their hub. Players would encounter monsters while out in the field in random encounters, and from here your typical turn-based combat would play out. An interesting thing to note is the fact that during combat, monsters would be seen from a first person's perspective, rather than a third person's perspective as you see these days. There was also no party system at this point, with players taking on the role of a lone character. The further you got from the castle, the stronger the monsters would get, and defeating these monsters would award experience points and gold, which could then be used in the shops to upgrade your gear. Now during development, one of the focal points was to have the player associate themselves with the hero. This was achieved through emotional storytelling and a coming of age tale that audiences couldn't help but relate to. It also started to brew this idea of power fantasies, as players would feel significantly stronger as they worked their way through the game. These features all culminated in a game that was extremely well received in Japan, selling over 1.5 million copies. The American release, which had been titled Dragon Warrior, didn't fare as well, but still managed to sell over 500,000 copies. From here, the Dragon Quest 
Quest franchise exploded, producing countless sequels at a consistent rate to this day. Each new iteration would add something new, like new items and characters in Dragon Quest 2, or new character classes in Dragon Quest 3. Dragon Quest 5 even added the ability to recruit monsters into your party. These additions, paired with expanded quests and stories, elevated Dragon Quest to legendary status in Japan. Unfortunately, Dragon Quest lagged behind in the West though, for reasons we'll get into when we talk about another juggernaut. Even so, the franchise would go on to sell over 88 million copies making it not only one of the biggest RPG franchises in the world, but also one of the most successful franchises in general. The series has branched off to include animated shows, manga series, and plenty of merchandise. The release of Dragon Quest XI also broke through to the West more than any other title, and I must say is one of the best JRPGs I have ever personally played. With Dragon Quest XII in development, the future of Dragon Quest looks brighter than ever, and it is without a doubt a flagship franchise. We're back to title with these next few franchises, the first of which being Arkanoid. Now Arkanoid may look familiar to a game I mentioned earlier, I'm sure you can see the similarities. And that's essentially what Arkanoid was, it was an improved version of Breakout, now featuring power-ups that could increase the length of Vos, slow the ball down, or even grant an extra life. Arkanoid's addictive nature propelled it to commercial stardom, where it became the most successful table arcade cabinet of 1987 in Japan. Interestingly though, when it comes to sequels and the like, this franchise follows a strange pattern. The franchise would see a sequel developed and released almost immediately following the success of its predecessor, but following this, the franchise wouldn't see another entry until a decade later with Arkanoid Do It Again and Arkanoid Returns, which were both released in 1997. Following Arkanoid R 2000 and 1999, the franchise went back into hibernation until 2007 with Arkanoid DS. I'm sure you see the pattern I'm talking about, as the same thing would happen in the 2000s, where after a spree of games that were released in 2009, the franchise would enter another hibernation phase, just to come back in 2017. Every time this franchise comes out of hibernation, it's always on the 7th year of the decade. It's like some kind of conspiracy theory. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I thought it was a strange coincidence. Arkanoid's latest release dates back to just last year with Arkanoid Eternal Battle. I guess we'll have to wait until 2027 to see another game. But for now, this franchise can sit within the It Exist here. Now Taito was arguably in its prime during this period, as their next release would perform just as well as Arkanoid. Bubble Bobble were a set of platform games that followed two adorable dragons, Bub and Bob, as they set out to save their girlfriends from the cave of monsters. The birth child of designer Fuku MTG Mitsuji, Bubble Bobble had been developed as a means to rejuvenate Taito's presence in the industry, as Mitsuji believed a lot of Taito's games were mediocre at best. He thought it best to have focused on cooperative gameplay, as it would allow for more dynamic and fun instances between players. Now as you'd expect, each dragon is controlled by a separate player, with the goal being to trap enemies in bubbles that you blow out before popping them. Each level consisted of a single screen with no scrolling and players would work their way through each one until level 100, where they would face off against the boss. Now Bubble Bobble was one of the very first games ever to feature multiple endings, as beating the boss in single player would reveal a message saying that the game hadn't truly ended yet, and that they'd need to come back with a friend. Should two players complete the game, they would be rewarded with a happy ending. As stated, Bubble Bobble was extremely popular, quickly becoming the second most successful arcade cabinet of the month, with the most successful being Taito's own Arkanoid. This resulted in the franchise expanding to monumental levels, with over 30 official ports being issued to every console you could ever think of, as well as over 20 sequels, remakes, and spin-offs released throughout the years. The franchise still pumps out games to this day, with both Puzzle Bobble VR and Puzzle Bobble Every Bubble releasing within the last two years. And while I can't say this makes it a flagship franchise, I do believe you could argue that it is a mainstay. Taito's next franchise went by the name Kiki Kai Kai, or Pocky and Rocky outside of Japan. These were a series of side-scrolling shooters where you would play as Pocky, a young Shinto shrine maiden, and a Tanuki for companion Rocky, as you fought your way through a variety of monsters. As seen in the gameplay, these games pulled a lot from Japanese mythology, often featuring many Japanese legendary creatures. The series first began with Kiki Kai Kai in 1986, which remains a Japanese exclusive. After being licensed out to Natsume in the early 1990s and renamed to Pocky and Rocky, the series would make its way over to the West, where it was well received and got a further two sequels. Most recently, the franchise would get a new game titled Pocky and Rocky Reshrine in 2022, which loosely followed on from the ending of the first Pocky and Rocky game. In saying this, the game featured a mix of revamped stages from the original game as well as a number of original stages. And while it wasn't a smash hit, it did manage to sell over 100,000 copies, which is impressive seeing that it's been nearly two decades since the previous title. With this new release, Pocky and Rocky has managed to slot itself into the It Exist tier. Taito would start off 1987 with Darius, a horizontal scrolling shooter game that had players control a starship named the Silverhawk. Their goal was to destroy the Belza Empire before they could wipe out the planet Darius. 
In order to make the game stand out from the crowd, the cabinet itself used three individual monitors placed beside each other. This made the game appear much wider than your typical horizontal shooter, and clever use of mirror effects made sure these monitors looked like they were seamlessly connected. Now as for the gameplay, it was your typical spacecraft shooter. Players would be equipped with numerous weapons like front firing missiles, aerial bombs, and a protective force field, all of which could be upgraded with power-ups. Darius would go on to become quite successful, securing a spot as the third most popular arcade game of 1987 in Japan. The franchise has had its fair share of sequels throughout the years with many even releasing within the last decade. Darius Burst and its arcade counterpart Darius Burst and Other Chronicle seem to have breathed new life into the franchise and have since become the main release titles with both Darius Cosmic Revelation and Darius Burst and Other Chronicle EX Plus releasing in 2021. I must say, I'm impressed that franchises as old as these are still kicking, and I'll happily place them within the It Exists tiers. Taito, without a doubt, had a strong foothold within the arcade industry during this period, and their next franchise, Operation Wolf, continues to prove that. The Operation Wolf franchise was a set of light gun shooters centered around military themed missions like rescuing hostages and taking out enemy soldiers. The original would go on to receive critical acclaim quickly becoming one of the highest grossing arcade games of 1988. A further three sequels would follow, until Operation Target in 1998, with each iteration being commercially successful. Following Operation Target though, it seemed as if the franchise had died off. One decade passed with nothing, and then another, with no new news. It was seemingly another arcade classic that was lost to time. Well, that wasn't until miraculously the franchise would be revived following the release of Operation Wolf Returns first mission in 2023. This remake would introduce a new survival mode as well as the ability to play with a friend in a co-op mode. Amazingly, this means, yet again, a franchise that was seemingly dive-bombing towards the dead tier has managed to take a detour into the It Exists tier. But if there was one franchise though, that wouldn't have to worry about dive-bombing anywhere near the dead tier, it would without a doubt be this next one. What's there to say about this franchise that hasn't been said a million times already? When people hear the words role-playing game, this is the franchise that comes to mind. This is what JRPGs are. And it wouldn't be wrong to say that this franchise single-handedly popularized the genre in the West. Beginning as a series pushed to rival Enix's Dragon Quest, Final Fantasy quickly exploded in popularity, quickly becoming one of the biggest media franchises in gaming history. Across all its games, the franchise has sold over 185 million units, an unbelievable number of copies, for a genre that going into the 21st century wasn't necessarily the most popular with Western audiences. For many, the series peaked with Final Fantasy VII. It released as the very first entry to feature both full motion video and 3D graphics, and while the gameplay and battle system remained relatively similar to its predecessors, the massive improvements in graphics as well as the more widespread focus on science fiction and steampunk elements added a realistic touch to an otherwise fantasy game that did exceptionally well in the West. Now here's my hot take of the day. Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy IX are better than Final Fantasy VII. Yep, I said it. I personally enjoy the characters and their stories a lot more so in the latter game than in Final Fantasy VII. Feel free to leave a dislike now. The franchise has spawned numerous remakes, remasters, and even a whole spin-off series that performs well in its own right. What's not to love about these games? The fact that each and every game explores its own worlds with its own unique set of characters and storylines means that no matter who you are, there's probably a game in this franchise that would resonate with you. Oh, and the music. The goddamn music. Some of the most emotional, impactful tunes that I've ever heard have come from these games. And I don't know about you guys, but I've spent hours on end just listening to the Victory fanfare choose on repeat. At the end of the day, you know it, I know it, this franchise is Square Enix. It's the first franchise anyone thinks of when their name is brought up, and it therefore deserves the top spot within the flagship tier. We're back with Tyro for this next one. Honestly, for a video titled The Current State of Every Square Enix Franchise, there's an awful lot of, well, not Square Enix. Sorry guys, I, I guess you've been clickbaited. Now while Enix and Square were beginning to monopolize the RPG genre, Taito on the other hand still had a strong grasp on the arcade industry. The next franchise Chase would continue this trend, becoming Japan's highest grossing arcade game of 1989, as well as becoming a hit overseas. Chase was a series of vehicle combat racing games where you would have to chase down a criminal who started miles away before time ran out. This meant that players who drove too slowly or crashed too frequently would most often than not fail to apprehend the criminal's car. Upon reaching that target, the time limit would be extended and players would need to collide with the enemy car enough to bring it 
to a stop. The franchise would get numerous sequels and spin-offs over the years, ending with Chase HQ2, which was released in 2007. Following the release of this arcade game, the franchise has seemingly tapered off. Unfortunately, it's unlikely to ever return. But hey, you never know. As we've seen so far, Taito's franchises have a knack for coming back. Now following the immense success of Final Fantasy, Square made sure to capitalise on the name they had built for themselves. And I mean that in a literal sense. The Saga franchise first began in 1989, with the release of the Final Fantasy Legend. Now despite its name, this game was the start of a wholly new franchise. And while its gameplay may have mimicked earlier Final Fantasy titles, as the franchise expanded over the years, it took on an identity of its own. Unlike the streamlined linear Final Fantasy games, the Saga series emphasises non-linear gameplay through its open worlds that incorporate an open open-ended branching plot. Many consider it to be ahead of its time and extremely innovative, with a lot of focus being placed on the replayability of each game, most often highlighted by the fact that players could go through the game as numerous characters, all while having a completely different experience with each one. The first romancing saga game, which was released in 1992, would also step away from Final Fantasy by removing random encounters, now allowing players to engage in battles they wanted while also engaging in what was dubbed the free scenario system. Unlike Final Fantasy, there were no experience points to be had here with each character's statistics being raised based on the actions they performed in battle. Later games would adopt a more intuitive turn-based combat system, now relying more on battle points to complete actions within their designated moves. These unique differences helped Saga break away from its initial affliction with Final Fantasy, and it has since become a fairly successful and popular franchise in its own right. The series has become one of Square Enix's most successful franchises, selling over 10 million copies, and has continued to release consistently to this day, with the latest game, Saga Emerald Beyond, looking to release in 2024. Taking all of this into account, Saga definitely deserves a spot amongst the mainstays. Now at this point in time, Square and Taito were going back and forth with their franchises, but in saying this, the games they made couldn't have been any more different. In fact, every new release developed by Taito seemed to be completely different from the one they had developed previously. Power Blade, which was Taito's next franchise, proves this as players would take control of Nova, who was armed with a boomerang of all things, as he looked to recover data tapes from six different databases. In a similar sense to the Mega Man series, Power Blade allowed players to choose to play any of six levels, meaning you could complete them in any order. The boomerang itself could also be fired in eight different directions, which was indeed a rarity during this period of time, especially for 2D platformer games. The game would go on to receive decent reviews, and even get its own sequel a year later with Power Blade 2, which played very similarly to its predecessor. Unfortunately, Power Blade 2 didn't live up to the expectations of Taito, and was hit with mediocre reviews. It's most likely due to this underwhelming performance that we haven't seen a new game since. Now, if you ever wanted to learn about evolution through a video game, then this next franchise would be your best bet. The EVO franchise of Evolution were a set of action-adventure games that drew elements from platformers and RPGs. These games really took taking control of your own destiny to heart, and had players work their way up the food chain by starting off as a small fish. They would then have to fight their way through numerous side-scrolling levels, many of which would translate to different periods of time, all while undergoing bodily evolution. By eating the smaller prey, players would earn evolution points, which could be spent to evolve certain parts of their body, meaning that no two players' experiences would be the same when playing through this game. As silly as it sounds, almost like your magic carp looking to become Gyarados, these games truly were ahead of their time. The series unfortunately only ever got two entries, ending with Evo Search for Eden in 1992, and seeing as we haven't heard any news regarding this lost gem since, it's most likely a dead franchise by now. Now any guesses on what Taito's next franchise would encompass? Well, for those of you who guessed a series of football games, I congratulate you, as Taito's next franchise was Football Champ or Hattrick Hero, as it came to be known later on. There's not too much to say about this short lineup of games, they were your standard arcade football simulation games, with a few neat differences. Some of these included the option to choose a star player from a choice of four, and also giving players the ability to partake in some violent acts, such as throwing punches, using flying kicks, and even shirt pulling. Overall though, this franchise is most likely a dead one, as there hasn't been a new edition since Hattrick Hero 95, which, yep, you guessed it, released all the way back in 1995. Now this next franchise is definitely an interesting one, and truly really goes to show just how expansive Taito's imagination was when it came to developing new unique games. Sonic Blast Man was a beat-em-up that you would essentially play in real life. What I mean by this is that players would take the role of titular superhero Sonic Blast Man, with the goal being to hit enemies and targets that had different sets of resistances. The most interesting aspect though was the cabinet that this game utilised. On it was a pad that players had to hit, and as painful as that sounds, thankfully the cabinet also came with a pair of gloves that players would wear when punching that pad. Unfortunately this still didn't stop numerous players from hurting themselves, and in 1995 Taito had to recall all the Sonic Blast machines because 
because of this. The following year, they were asked to pay a fine of $50,000 for failing to disclose what exactly these injuries were. Fortunately for the franchise though, the series did get its very own SNES version, which featured very different gameplay. Both the arcade and SNES versions got their own sequels before Taito revealed at AOU 2010 a third sequel titled Sonic Blast Heroes. That game would go on to be released a year later in 2011 and also marks the latest title in the Sonic Blast Man franchise. In saying this, it's most likely on its last legs for now. Now interestingly enough, this next franchise was not developed by Taito or Enix, but instead by a smaller company called Quintet. At the time, Quintet had a strong partnership with Enix, with Actraiser being one of the many games Enix published from them. Actraiser was a jack of all trades, incorporating platforming, city building, RPG and god game aspects all into one. Players would play as the master, however due to the master itself never being directly controlled, players would instead interact with the world through an angel and a statue. The idea was to build a new civilization and allow them to prosper. Players could build roads, control the weather, and use miracles to help with all of this. Alongside this, players could take control of the angel to take out monsters in the area, as well as interact with action sequences by controlling a statue that's tasked with destroying monsters on specific platforms. It's honestly quite an impressive and complex game, all things considered, especially for the time. The game would go on to garner very positive reviews, and sell incredibly well, having over 600,000 units shipped worldwide. The success led to the development of a sequel titled Actraiser 2, which was released three years later in 19. The sequel, unlike its predecessor, took the form of a simple platform game, with many believing it to be inferior due to this fact. Following a few failed attempts at a third sequel, the franchise would be revived in 2021, when an enhanced remake titled Actraiser of Renaissance would release on all modern consoles. Once again, Square Enix has proven that they're willing to show some of their oldest franchises some love, no matter how long it's been. If you saw Dragon Quest, Final Fantasy, and Nintendo characters playing each other in Monopoly, who do you think would win? Well. The answer is Square Enix, because they're the ones making all the money from Itadaki Street, the next franchise on this list. Now from my knowledge, the series remained a Japanese exclusive for years, and was developed by Yuji Horii, the same one who had worked on Dragon Quest in its inception. After a number of title releases, Hori stated that he wanted to bring the games to the West, and soon after, Fortune Street would be released for the Wii in 2011. This set of party games played an awful lot like Monopoly, with players moving around a board by rolling a die, all while purchasing unowned property and earning money when opponents landed on their spaces. There were also mini games to play, and a simplified version of a stock market that more advanced players could tap into. As simple as the game sounds, the selling power came from the characters included even though most people can probably admit that these characters added nothing to the actual gameplay experience. The series has been released somewhat consistently over the last three decades, with the latest iteration dating back to 2017. While it's hard to gauge the likelihood of the franchise continuing, I think based on the consistent sales across its games, we'll most likely see a new edition eventually. In saying that, I can't really warrant putting it into It Exists at the moment, as there hasn't been a new release in years. So far, we've covered two of Square Enix's three pillars, and this next franchise isn't that third one. Although if you were to get me to rank it among those other three, I would probably say it's better than one of them. I'm not going to say which one in fear that I'm going to be assassinated, but I truly do think that the minor franchise is underappreciated when compared to the other three titans. Oops, I stopped my editing there. I meant to show Mana. Wait, what, what do you mean that's the first entry in the franchise? Yeah, so Square really was milking the Final Fantasy name. First with the Saga franchise and now with the Mana franchise. You'd honestly think these games were spin-off franchises of the mainline series, but at one point they shifted to become their own standalone franchises. Following its first entry, the series really spun off into its own identity with the release of Secret of Mana, which not only broke away from Final Fantasy but also from the large majority of RPG titles at the time. Secret of Mana used a real-time battle system, as well as its own unique ring command system that allowed players to pause in the middle of battles to allow for any adjustments they needed to make. It also featured cooperative play, where a second or third player could drop in and out of the game at any time, pack on an expansive story, an exceptional OST, and a charming yet simple graphical style, and you've got a game that was praised to the high heavens. Its success birthed numerous sequels and spin-offs that were released throughout the decades. These days, however, the franchise has fallen victim to the remake curse, and while I thoroughly enjoyed the Trials of Mana remake from 2020, it does hurt to see no new original entries being developed and released. The franchise has managed to sell over 12 million copies across its games, making it one of Square Enix's most successful series. In my eyes, it is without a doubt a Square Enix mainstay. If it had some newer releases in the recent years, I would definitely consider it even a flagship.
Thunderhawk, huh? Doesn't sound like a franchise Square Enix would develop, does it? And that's because, well, it wasn't. Here's where things get somewhat confusing, but I'll try my best to lay out the groundwork for it. See, Thunderhawk was initially developed by a company known as Core Design, who at the time were their own independent developer. Eventually though, they would be bought out by Eidos Interactive in 1996. And despite most of their personnel and assets going to Rebellion Developments in 2006, Eidos managed to hold on to their IPs. But hold on, Eidos Interactive isn't Square Enix, or at least they weren't yet. Eidos was actually a subsidiary of another combined company known as SCI Entertainment Group, which was then taken over by the combined Square Enix in 2009, finally completing the merger between all these companies. So yes, Core Design, the original developers of Thunderhawk are no longer with us, but their IP lives on. Well, not, not really. The Thunderhawk franchise were a set of combat flight simulation games where players piloted an attack helicopter as they worked their way through several campaigns. The original game remains one of the very few on this entire list that is never released in Japan. Even so, the franchise sold well enough to garner two sequels, Thunderhawk 2 in 1995 and Thunderhawk Operation Phoenix in 2001. Unfortunately, with Core Design in a dead tier of its own, it seems very unlikely that Square Enix will be reviving this specific franchise. This next franchise is an interesting one. Championship Manager, as you'd expect, were a set of football management games designed by brothers Paul and Oliver Collier, who, believe it or not, wrote the whole game from their bedrooms. In saying this, the initial games weren't breakout hits or anything, but they did garner their own set of fans in the UK. Each new release would build on top of the previous, and with each, the popularity of the series would rise. Again though, this doesn't sound like anything Square Enix would get involved with. But in a strange twist of fate, Square Enix themselves were said to have revived this franchise. The Championship Manager franchise, like most of its competitors, often released on a yearly basis. At least that was the case until Championship Manager 2011, where following its release, the franchise would go dark for three years. Square Enix would then find itself in the picture, reviving the series as Champ Man, and releasing games for it on mobile devices from 2013 to 2018. Unfortunately, on the 31st of May 2018, Square Enix seized all online services for the games and removed them from iOS and Android app stores. It's bittersweet seeing them come to the rescue and revive a franchise only to kill it off not long after. Now before coming into this video, I was unaware of just how many subsidiaries or companies Square Enix had gobbled up over its lifetime. But this next franchise continuing to prove just that. The Ogre Battle franchise were a set of tactical role-playing and real-time strategy games that had been developed by a company called Quest. Funnily enough, in 1995, a few key members actually left Quest to join Square, only for Square to then go and purchase the whole company a bit later in 2002. This does mean though that the Ogre franchise is now owned by Square Enix, but thankfully this time they haven't left it out to die. The series itself started back in 1993, with the real-time strategy game Ogre Battle, The March of the Black Queen. It wasn't until the release of its successor, Tactics Ogre, that the franchise finally gained some recognition though. Tactics Ogre was a tactical RPG that, unlike its predecessor, used a turn-based battle system System dubbed the non-alternative turn system. Battles would take place on one map that was viewed from an overhead diagonal perspective. The map itself was split up using a grid with characters being able to move a certain number of grid spaces each turn. The game also featured branching story paths which were laid out based on the player's decisions when it came to accepting or rejecting the commands of authority figures. The game would sell incredibly well, especially for the genre, which not only led to the development of a third game but also a remake which was released in 2010. This game was so good though that a single remake wouldn't suffice. And just like that, Tactics Ogre would go on to get a remaster titled Tactics Ogre Reborn, which was released last year in 2022. This is yet another franchise that has escaped the lower tiers by seemingly being revived in recent years. The Seventh Saga was the next RPG series to be released by Enix, and it added a few notable innovations to the genre. The game itself is wildly interesting to me, as players get to choose one of seven playable characters who all embark on their own quest to locate seven magical ruins. Throughout the game, you would often come across these other playable characters, and would be able to partner up with them and fight as a team. The addition of a crystal ball radar allowed players to see where enemies would approach from, essentially killing off random encounters entirely if you were paying enough attention. As for the gameplay itself, it played like your typical turn-based RPG, where you would talk to NPCs for quests and trade with them to upgrade your gear. Defeating monsters would garner you experience points, which could then be used to level up skills. For the most part, it was a solid game and garnered decently positive reviews upon its release. The franchise would see a Japanese sequel in the form of Mystic Arc, which was released two years later in 1995. And while plans to localize the game to the west existed at the time, they never came to fruition. Regardless, this franchise hasn't seen a new entry since Mystic Arc, and is therefore another dead franchise. Up next on the ever-growing list of RPG franchises, we have Lufia. 
much like the Dragon Quest series of games, the player takes control of the hero and his companions as they venture through a fantasy world on a quest to prevent the resurrection of the four superpowered beings called Sinatrolls. This series very obviously drew inspiration from Dragon Quest, as alongside the typical random encounters, the game also viewed its turn-based combat system through a first-person's perspective. The game was generally well received, resulting in multiple sequels up until Lufia Curse of the Sinatrolls, which was released back in 2010 for the Nintendo DS. Unfortunately, this title was a financial bomb, which most likely deterred Square Enix from continuing the franchise as there hasn't been a new game since. Eclipse was a series of space flight simulation games developed by Crystal Dynamics, a subsidiary of Eidos Interactive and Square Enix before being sold to Embracer Group in 2022. As we'll discuss very soon, this deal resulted in numerous franchises shifting ownership. In this case, Eclipse wasn't one of them. Now, despite being described as space flight simulation games, the actual gameplay had players flying their ships across stages that mimicked planetary surfaces and tunnels, and not so much the vast open emptiness of space. Players would collect power-ups by navigating these tunnels, which were essential when looking to deal with the boss at the end of each world. Now, despite the game receiving mediocre reviews, it did end up getting its very own sequel called Solar Eclipse, which took its flight simulation and put it on some rails, in a similar sense to the Star Fox series of games. Following the sequel though, the franchise would die out, aimlessly drifting in the vast expanses of space, never to be seen again. Now, it's been a while, but we're back with Taito for this next franchise. The race series was a set of vertical scroller shooters, where players would take the reins of a ship called the... Yeah, no, no sure I'm saying that. The game is played very much like your typical old school vertical shooters, where you'd blast your way through numerous stages. In typical Taito fashion though, the game went on to become an arcade hit, securing a spot as the third most popular arcade unit at the time. The franchise would see the release of a sequel in 1996, as well as a prequel in 1998. The sequel in particular differentiated itself from the rest with its usage of polygon-based ships instead of sprites. This seemingly worked out for the better though, as Ray Storm would become one of the most popular arcade games in Japan, ranking just behind the fabled Star Fox 64 when it came to Shooter Game of the Year. Despite its success, the franchise hasn't seen a new release in decades decades, and is therefore most likely a dead one. The Front Mission franchise is a collection of turn-based tactical RPGs that pretty much hit on every other genre possible with its spin-offs. I'm talking side-scrolling shooters, real-time strategy games, MMOs, and even third-person shooters, all contained into one franchise. For the most part, the mainland entries followed a similar pattern where players control mechas known as Wanzas. Unlike typical mechas in other games though, these units were made up of four separate parts, the body, left arm, right arm, and the legs, with each offering its own set of unique abilities while also having its own health bars. Destroying specific parts of each unit would hinder its capabilities in a multitude of ways, so it's up to the player to customise their mechas in a way that would allow them to shred through the competition while taking minimal damage. The series has expanded to include a ton of sequels and spin-offs. These spin-offs, like I've mentioned, pretty much hit every other genre possible, and while they weren't necessarily popular releases, they all added to the 3 million units this franchise has sold. During its early years, Front Mission released quite frequently, with the games coming out every few years. After Front Mission evolved in 2010, however, this trend seemed to die down, and for the next 9 years, fans of the franchise were left out to dry. No updates, no new releases, nothing. For all intents and purposes, it seems as if the franchise was dead. At least that was the case until 2019, when a new game set in the very same universe as Front Mission would be released. That game was left alive which unlike its preceding titles, focused more on stealth-like gameplay where the goal was to survive and evade enemies rather than engage in full-on. Left Alive would be barely Left Alive following rough reviews, but thankfully its release led to the development of a further stream of remakes that have consistently been released since 2022. I'm torn on where to place this one in particular, but seeing as it's just come back from the grave, I think it'll have to slot into the It Exists tier. We've arrived at one of the best franchises in gaming history. If you don't agree with me, then, well, you're either wrong or you haven't played Chrono Trigger. Developed by the Dream Team, Chrono Trigger was released to universal acclaim and is often considered one of the greatest RPG games of all time. In an era where JRPGs were on the rise, Chrono Trigger managed to incorporate fresh ideas, many of which went on to become revolutionary aspects that would shape the genre going forward. In terms of its gameplay, Chrono Trigger used the active time battle system that had been used in previous Final Fantasy games. And for the most part, it played like your typical RPG. You'd take control of Chrono and his companions as you adventured through a world that resembles Earth to some degree, while fighting monsters, completing quests, and solving puzzles. Where the game starts to deviate though is with its use of story elements and how they shape a player's experience. See, Chrono Trigger deals with time travel, 
so much so that it becomes an integral part of the game. As you play it, you will travel from the Middle Ages, to the prehistoric past, and then even to the post-apocalyptic future, with each time period involving different elements, quests, and even enemies. One of the biggest things implemented into this game were the hidden side quests, that not only fleshed out the side characters and gave them a lot of background story, but also allowed you to unlock their ultimate weapons. The game was truly ahead of its time featuring 13 possible endings depending on when and how you dealt with the game's final battle. Not only did this add a ridiculous amount of replayability, but it opened up a whole new experience the second or third time you played it. More often than not, you discover wholly hidden and secret areas you never knew existed on your first playthrough. Oh, and did I mention it was the first game ever to use the term New Game Plus? You know, the one that's become a staple in all modern day RPGs? The game was an instant hit in Japan, selling over 2 million copies, and while its two follow-ups, Radical Dreamers and Chrono Cross didn't reach that same level, they too were considered exceptional titles for the time. The question then becomes then, why hasn't this legendary set of games received any new titles since 1999? The series has seen its fair share of ports and remasters, the latest of which being the Chrono Cross Radical Dreamers Edition remaster, which was released last year in 2022. But when it comes to a new original game, there hasn't been any news regarding one for decades now. Many speculate that Square Enix doesn't want to touch the series as they don't have the dream team anymore, whereas others believe it's because it's not financially viable considering the sales of the franchise as a whole. Either way, it's unlikely we'll get a new game anytime soon, but I am holding out hope for a Chrono Trigger remaster at least at some point. For now, and this is my bias showing, I think it can sit in the It Exists here due to the recent remaster of Chrono Cross. If not, it would place much much lower, most likely even in the dead tier. We go from one iconic franchise to another, with this one having its very own mascot. Gex, like the Eclipse series, was a franchise developed by Crystal Dynamics. The Gex games followed the titular character Gex, who was an anthropomorphic gecko that was obsessed with television. This obsession is incorporated into the game as well and has Gex travel through numerous side-scrolling levels that were contained within different TV channels. As he was a gecko, Gex had access to some interesting abilities like being able to attach himself to walls and crawl across ceilings to access areas that would normally be out of reach. The original game would garner very positive reviews and sell incredibly well with some reports stating it to have sold over 1 million copies. The success led to the development of two sequels, the 3D platformer Gex Enter the Gecko in 1998 and Gex 3 Deep Cover Gecko which was released a year later in 1999. Now with regards to new releases, unfortunately this is where the franchise ends. This isn't to say there's no hope at all, as both Sony and Square Enix have published the set of games on multiple platforms in recent years. Interestingly, Square Enix announced in 2013 that they would be holding a Square Enix Collective program, where they would give upcoming developers a chance to develop a new game on one of their series, Gex being one of them. Unfortunately, it seems as if nothing came from this program, once again placing Gex in a tight spot. Limited run games would shine some light on the franchise after announcing the Gex trilogy earlier this year. This was merely a compilation release of the first three games, however, and while it's appreciated, it's not necessarily pushing the franchise to new heights. For a franchise that has sold over 15 million copies, it's sad that it hasn't been expanded upon in recent decades. The re-releases and emulation upgrades are nice, and just barely keeping it from the lower tiers, but I would like to see Gex return in fashion for real sometime in the near future. It feels like I'm jumping all over the place here, but I guess that's what happens when one company has a billion subsidiaries working for them. Cleopatra Fortune was a 1995 arcade game that functioned just like Tetris. Players would direct blocks of stone and create closures which would eliminate the treasure and add to the player's score. The game was fairly simple, but it still managed to garner a few ports and sequels, the latest of which being Cleopatra Fortune Plus, which was released back in 2002. Now I say this, but in 2022, City Connection actually published a port of the Sega Saturn version to modern day consoles titled Cleopatra Fortune S Tribute. Now I'm unsure if this has any relation to Square Enix or if it's just more of a tribute considering its name, but either way it does add some life back into the franchise. Whether it's enough to push it out of life support, I don't think so. Now I think it's about time we discuss the elephant in the room. Why haven't you subscribed yet? I mean you've already listened to me ramble on for quite a while now, so you might as well just hit the subscribe button. Alright, with that shameless plug out of the way, what I did want to touch on was the relationship between Square Enix and Embracer Group. As I mentioned before, Square acquired Eidos Interactive back in 2009, and with that came numerous IPs such as Tomb Raider, Hitman, and Deus Ex, among others. Early last year though, Square Enix announced that it would sell several Square Enix assets to Embracer Group. These assets included several development studios like Crystal Dynamics, Square Enix Montreal, and Eidos Montreal, as well as a few IPs, those being, funnily enough, Tomb Raider, Deus Ex, 
Thief, Legacy of Kain, and Hitman alongside 50 back catalogue games. Square Enix therefore no longer holds the rights to these franchises, and as such they won't be included on this list. I thought I should at least mention them though as they make up some fairly influential and popular franchises. Anyway, back to Square Enix owned franchises like Psychic Force which was developed by Taito. Now Psychic Force was a series of fighting games that while appearing in 3D actually played in 2D. While the gameplay was that of your typical fighters, Psychic Force switched things up with, you guessed it, Psychic Powers that allowed players to float inside the battle space and move in all directions. The force field that makes up the arena also plays into the strategy of players, as characters that are forced into it by their opposition take damage and are then susceptible to a follow-up attack that will stun them, causing them to plummet through the air. The game did well in arcades and secured itself a sequel which was released a few years later in 1998. Psychic Force 2012 used the same system as its predecessor while adding a plethora of new playable characters. The game was originally released in arcades, but would get a port to the Dreamcast, becoming one of the console's early titles. The success of the sequel led to the creation of an anniversary pack that included both the original game as well as a remixed version of 12 titled Psychic Force 2012 EX. This pack was released back in 2006 and also marks the latest entry into the franchise as of the current day. In saying this, it's highly unlikely we will see the return of Psychic Force considering Square Enix's current focus areas. Now if you thought the 13 possible endings from Chrono Trigger were impressive, wait till you see how many are in this next franchise. Star Ocean was Enix's latest RPG franchise and was arguably one of the earliest to allow players to alter the story's outcome through player actions and dialogue choices. See, these games introduced a social relationship system, often referred to as private actions. These were instances where the protagonist's relationship with other characters would be affected by certain player choices. These would in turn affect the direction of the storyline which leads to branching paths and yep you guessed it multiple endings. If we expand this to include the franchise's second entry, fittingly titled Star Ocean The Second Story, you'll find that the number of possible endings could go as high as 86. Yeah, talk about replayability. Now these relationships didn't just affect the storyline, but also expanded to affect the way in which characters behave towards each other in battle. Speaking of battles, Star Ocean mixed this up as well. Whereas the top of the line RPGs like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest use turn based systems, Star Ocean opted to have its battles play out in real time, where players would take control of one member of the party with the choice to switch between any of them at any time. By the time the franchise reached its third entry, additional aspects had been added like a fury and bonus battle gauge, and with the release of the remake First Departure, the game introduced a combo attack system where special attacks stacked on top of each other and became more powerful. As a whole, the franchise has released numerous titles with multiple remakes, spin-offs and ports. For the most part, the mainline entries are released on a consistent schedule, with the latest Star Ocean The Second Story R releasing earlier this year. With over 4 million units shipped, Star Ocean remains one of Square Enix's most successful franchises, and taking that into account as well as its consistent release schedule, I do believe Star Ocean has done enough to warrant a spot in the mainstays. Here we have one of the few non-RPG titles released by Square. Now I can only assume that Square saw the massive rise of fighting games during the 90s and wanted to capitalise on the hype, as the next franchise they released happened to be a set of fighting games called Topol. Now you'd expect a fighting game, especially in the 90s, to play somewhat like all your other standard fighters, but this is Square we're talking about. So while the battle system and fighting gameplay followed the traditional route, Square added their own tweaks through a quest mode where players would explore 3D dungeons while avoiding traps and engaging in a number of enemies along the way. I mean you have to hand it to them, they somehow implemented RPG elements into a fighting game, with enemies sometimes dropping items that could restore your HP or even lower it back down to one point. By defeating certain characters in this quest mode, it would then unlock them as playable characters in the game's other modes. The characters and art direction were once again designed by Dragon Ball legend Akira Toriyama, who by this point must be a superhuman, like where does he find all the time to do all these things? Upon its release, the game topped Japanese sale charts, selling well over 850,000 copies in its lifetime, which honestly is extraordinary considering it's a fighting game and not an RPG by Square. These sales, however, were most likely inflated due to the fact that Toe Ball No. 1 actually came packaged with a pre-release demo of Final Fantasy VII, as well as video previews of numerous other games. Even so, Square had seemingly found a jackpot outside of the RPG market and immediately started development on a sequel, which was released just a year later titled Toe Ball 2. Now Toe Ball 2 used the same fighting system as its predecessor but heavily expanded its quest mode, now including numerous dungeons and even a hub zone at town where players could eat, sleep and shop for new items. The game also held the record for the largest roster of playable characters with an astronomical grand total of 200. Now despite critics praising it and believing it to be superior to its predecessor, they also went on to mention that it fell short when compared to the other titans of the genre like Tekken or Mortal Kombat. Square must have felt the same as there hasn't been a new entry since. Unfortunately, this unique fighter has to slot into the dead tier. 
We've arrived at another one of Crystal Dynamics' long lost franchises, or at least one of the franchises that wasn't sold off to Embracer Group. The franchise in question went by the name Pandemonium. These were a series of platformer games that merged 3D environments with 2D gameplay. This meant that stages had pathways that branched out, allowing players to choose their course throughout. An interesting addition to this game was the ability to choose which character you wanted to play before each level. The two characters each had their own special abilities, with Fargus the Joker being able to perform a special spinning attack, and Nikki the Sorceress having the magical ability to double jump. This added both replayability and some light strategy to each stage when deciding who would best suit that level. The game went on to receive mixed reviews but garnered a sequel nonetheless in Pandemonium 2. The sequel, like its predecessor, followed the same two characters but this time their abilities had been expanded upon now allowing them to climb ropes and pull themselves up ledges. Pandemonium 2 performed slightly better than its predecessor, however this didn't appear to be enough to warrant the continuation of this franchise, as following Pandemonium 2, the series seemingly died out. Yep, who'd have thought? Another fighting game from Square. I know, my jaw is just as low as yours right now. But Bushido Blade, much like Topo, wasn't your typical fighting game. While its gameplay may somewhat mimic that of a standard fighting game, the method by which you win is entirely unique to Bushido Blade. These games had no time limit or health bar and instead used a body damage system where even a single precise hit could result in instant death. Now instead of depleting a health bar, hitting opponents would slow their attack and running speed, or even cripple their legs entirely depending on where you hit. Because of these lethal attacks, characters were able to run, jump, and even climb around the 3D arenas during the fight, adding a lot of depth to the combat in a more creative and open-ended way. Like Tobal, these titles were received positively and even sold decently well for a fighting series not produced by Bandai Namco or Capcom. Unfortunately, following the release of Bushido Blade 2 in 1998, the franchise seemingly died off as well. Fighting Force was a set of beat-em-ups developed by Core Design during the late 90s. The game played like your typical beat-em-up with players choosing one of four characters before fighting their way through urban and science fiction environments. The biggest draw for these games was their characters. Each came with their own special move and had their own strengths and weaknesses. Jackson, for example, was a large slow bruiser that had immense strength being able to lift and throw large objects at enemies. Alana, on the other hand, was a fast but weaker hitting teenager who could also make use of jump kicks. Outside of that though, that was pretty much all this game had going for it. Upon receiving mixed reviews, Core Design decided to somehow make the sequel worse. It removed co-op play completely, as well as limiting players to only one playable character. Not sure what was going through their minds here. These changes resulted in even worse scores for the sequel, and despite a third game being planned, it was eventually cancelled following the departure of many key members from the team in 2003. This seems to be yet another franchise left out to die. I honestly can't believe this next one is a franchise, but you have to admit, Square Enix knows how to capitalize on their popular franchises. Yes, that's a chocobo. The same one that appears throughout the Final Fantasy series, except this time, he's the one in the spotlight. So what's a chocobo doing around these parts, you ask? Well, apparently everything, and I mean that. First, he's exploring a dungeon and a roguelike. Next thing you know, he's in a cart, racing around a track, and then he's back in his natural habitat taking on monsters and card games? I'm not really sure how else to summarize this franchise, it's pretty much a collection of games that are based on different genres, and the only thing bundling them all together is the fact that a chocobo is the main character. Even so, this franchise has consistently been released to this day, with both a recent remaster of Chocobo's Dungeon in 2019, as well as a new entry in the kart racing sector in 2022. Now I can't say it deserves mainstay status because of these games, one's just a remaster of an existing title and the other, while a wholly original game, is just a knockoff Mario Kart that if I'm being honest, just isn't very good. It most likely deserves to be in the It Exists here for now. Now prior to their merger discussions with Enix, Square was in full force pumping out new IPs like it was no one else's business. The next one went by the name Brave Fencer Musashi, an action RPG that involved real-time sword-based combat in a 3D environment rather than the usual turn-based system seen in most other RPGs at the time. Players took control of the game's titular character Musashi as he fought his way through enemies with his two swords which not only had their own unique abilities, but could also be used in conjunction with each other for unique techniques. The game would also feature its very own day and night cycle, which not only affected the townsfolk and monsters out in the field, but also Musashi's fatigue rating, as the longer players went without sleep, the more it would impact his combat ability. These elements were praised by critics, and the game went on to sell decently well, especially for a new IP. This would result in the game getting its very own sequel seven years later, titled Musashi Samurai Legend. Now while the sequel played a lot like its predecessor with real-time combat in a 3D environment, it didn't do enough to distinguish itself and went on to garner mediocre reviews. This is where the franchise is been left to this day, and seeing as there hasn't been any new updates, it most likely means it's slipping towards the dead tier. Oh boy, whatever happened to this franchise? Oh, 
yeah, never mind. God, talking about this series brings back some deep-rooted memories. I've personally only ever played the original Parasite Eve, and it was such a surreal experience at the time. This game was actually the sequel to the novel Parasite Eve, which had been written by Hideaki Sena and it was interesting in the way that it meshed together unique aspects of the RPG genre with survival horror elements. It was also Squaresoft's first M-rated game, and followed police officer Aya as she attempted to stop Eve, a woman looking to destroy the human race through human combustion, which funnily enough sounds a lot like what Square Enix did to this franchise with the third birthday. In an era where every new RPG game looked to incorporate unique additions to their system, Parasite Eve stood atop the rest with its unique battle system that allows you to pause time for a short period of time while you align your thoughts and strategies. Strategies. I remember thinking that being able to encounter enemies out in the same field that you'd just been walking around in, in real time as well, was such a cool feature and made it really feel like one cohesive world, unlike other RPGs where once you entered battle it would just be like a static background. Being that it was a survival horror game, many compared it to the Resident Evil series of games. And while it's hard to rate Parasite Eve over such an important franchise, I'd say the first Parasite Eve was definitely up there alongside them. The original was met with very positive reviews, and sold incredibly well for the time, shipping over 1 million copies. I can't say too much about the sequels, but there were two, the first of which was released a year later in 1999, and the other after a long drought period in 2010. I can, however, say with confidence after watching a few Parasite Eve retrospectives that not many people like this one, with some believing it to be the sole reason why there hasn't been a new entry or any remakes for the franchise since. Unfortunately, I have to place Parasite Eve into the life support tier, but it could potentially go even lower. I'd do anything to see even a remake of the original, but I guess that's up to Square Enix at this point. We go from one survival horror franchise to another with Chaos Heat. If you didn't know that the late 90s also marked the resurgence of Japanese horror, well, now you do. It was the latest fix not only in the gaming industry but also in cinema, with some of the greatest Japanese horror films being released during that period. Getting back on topic though, Taito wanted to capitalise on this new boom in the market, and in doing so would develop and release the survival horror game Chaos Heat. Unlike Parasite Eve, however, these games were very bare bones and played like your typical survival horror games without adding too many new features or innovative play options. I don't believe they were ever released in the US either, as the sequel Chaos Break only ever got a EU release in the year 2000. Now while I am silently hopeful with regards to a Parasite Eve remake, I don't think anyone should be holding their breath waiting for a new game from this franchise. The Gangsters franchise is a strange one, for one it originated in the west and never made it over to the east in any form, and they also remained PC exclusives. While this may sound like a series destined for failure, it actually performed extremely well. Now I have held some information here, these games weren't developed by Square or Enix, although based on the title I'm sure many of you already figured that out. No, these games were developed by Hot House Creations under Eidos Interactive, while they were still separate from Square Enix. The games themselves were essentially strategy games, and were rather complex for the time. Players would need to assign tasks to the gangsters under the control who would then go out and act them out in the real-time aspect of the game, which was often referred to as the working week. In order to win these games, players would need to keep expanding their territory. This could be done in numerous ways. You could purchase both legal and illegal businesses, loan the money through them, you could raid other businesses and bribe appropriate figureheads to help you with deals. Honestly, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted as long as you stayed out of trouble and weren't caught in the act. The first entry into this franchise exceeded expectations, selling well over 500,000 copies. The success led to the development of its sequel, which was released a few years later in 2001. Unfortunately, following the mixed reception and lackluster sales of its sequel, this franchise most likely was dropped, meaning we can slot it into the dead tier. With the ever-popular Final Fantasy VII in full effect, as well as their unique and interesting direction with Parasite Eve, Enix was seemingly falling behind Square. Now Star Ocean was a step in the right direction, but it wasn't nearly as popular as Square's latest releases. If only they had a game with innovative world movement, emotionally driven character sequences, and a unique battle system that could keep up with Square's creative endeavours. Oh, looks like they did just that. Valkyrie Profile was the latest RPG game released by Enix in 1999, and while it follows traditional RPG logic, the game actually plays more like a platform in certain segments. For one, the titular character Leneth has the ability to jump, slide attack, and shoot ice crystals while outside of combat. Upon contact with an enemy, the usual battle sequence starts, but instead of your typical turn-based system, Valkyrie Profile has the player's whole party share one turn, with each character being able to attack simultaneously during that one turn. This means you can string attacks together as combos, making it extremely hard for enemies to gain their footing. The most interesting aspect of this game though comes into play when you recruit fellow Ai Hanja, which were the souls of deceased warriors. Now upon recruiting them, you would often get to see the circumstances in which they died through cutscenes, 
These were usually very emotional moments, steeped in symbolism, and training them as part of your party afterwards just to send them off to Valhalla really pulled at your heartstrings. The game also offered three difficulty options, with each one including different characters to recruit, dungeons, and quests. Like Chrono Trigger, Valkyrie Profile offered multiple endings, one of which could only be viewed by completing certain objectives on a specific difficulty. Now Valkyrie Profile went on to become extremely successful, garnering very positive reviews and selling extremely well. It would then be followed by two prequels that also performed decently well, but after that, the series entered a long drought period. The franchise would get a slight revival with the reveal of Valkyrie Anatomia on iOS and Android, but after a few years this too would end. Miraculously though, Square Enix would actually fully revive the franchise after 15 years when they released Valkyrie Elysium in 2022. The game remained faithful to the groundwork laid out by previous installments, but shifted more towards a action-based battle system. This entry was met with mediocre reviews and sold relatively poorly in comparison. The series as a whole has sold over 2.2 million copies, and while it may not be one of the most popular franchises in the world, it's nice to see Square Enix keeping it alive. We've come across one of the more obscure titles with Urban Chaos. These were a set of action adventure games that had players roam through small maps as they engaged in a rather complex fighting system. You could kick, punch, throw, slide, tackle, and even arrest enemies. What you've done would make the populace more friendly towards the player. Honestly, there's not really too much information on this game, apart from it being nominated at one point for the worst game of the year, which it won runner-up for. So it baffles me how it got its own sequel years later in 2007, with Urban Chaos Riot response. The sequel did perform slightly better, but once again it didn't seem to do enough for Square Enix to want to continue it. Now after developing and releasing Urban Chaos, Eidos Interactive went straight back into development, and a year later they would release the first game in the Fear Effect series. As you can probably guess from its title, these were a series of survival horror games that had a few unique differences to them. For one, the player was able to shoot and move simultaneously, which was rare for the time, as most survival horror games would require the player to stand still while shooting, as a means to add suspense. Players would also be able to dual wield guns, and in doing so would allow them to shoot multiple enemies at once. The most interesting concept though, in my opinion, was the unique take on the player's health bar. Players would lose health upon being hit as usual, but the method in which you were able to gain it back was very unique. Essentially you had to perform tasks that would calm your character's heart rate. Things like solving a puzzle or sneaking up behind an enemy and performing a stealth kill would reward the player by giving them a small health boost. Following some exceptional reviews, the franchise would see the release of a further two games, a prequel in 2001 titled Fear Effect 2 Retro Helix, as well as an indie isometric title called Fear Effect Sedna, which was released in 2018. Square Enix would go on to announce a remake of Fear Effect titled Fear Effect Reinvented in 2017. Now this remake was initially left in the hands of French studio Sushi. The same ones that went on to develop Fear Effect Sedna, but was shifted to Megapixel Studio, who shifted what was supposed to be a faithful remake into a third person shooter. A trailer showcasing this direction would be shown at Gamescom 2022, before ending with a statement that it would be arriving soon. Coming into this year, however, it would be rumoured that the game had been cancelled. This would later be confirmed by staff on the Forever Entertainment's Discord, meaning the six year wait for the supposed remake never amounted to anything. Even so, with the somewhat recent release of Fear Effect Sedna, I can't say this franchise is completely dead, most likely sitting within the it exists or life support tier. Now coming into the 21st century, Square wasn't looking too hot. They'd put one too many eggs into the Final Fantasy basket, and while their games performed extremely well, their next endeavour using the fabled name would almost take them out completely. I'm talking about their ventures into the filming industry, where they spent an astronomical amount on their first film titled Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. Yeah, it didn't do too well. So much so that it scared off Enix from the potential merger that had been planned for years by this point. Thankfully though, a certain game had been under development since early 2000, and unbeknownst to everyone at the time, this game wouldn't just help Square stabilise their financial situation, but also go on to become one of the most beloved franchises in gaming history. Kingdom Hearts, where do I even begin? I'm sure most people watching this have heard of this franchise. I would consider it one of the three pillars of Square Enix alongside Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. As magical as this series is though, it will never be as surreal as the process of how it came to be. The original idea for Kingdom Hearts actually began with a discussion between Hashimoto and Sakaguchi about Super Mario 64. They wanted to design a game that had free movement in a 3D space just like it, but thought no other character apart from maybe Disney ones could rival Mario in terms of popularity. 
popularity. The heavens heard them apparently, and Hashimoto actually had a chance encounter with a Disney executive in an elevator of all places. This only happened because at the time, both Square and Disney worked in the same building. Now talk about the stars aligning. Even with this relationship established, Square wanted their own original character though. And after much deliberation, Sora was born. Now while Kingdom Hearts plays as an ARPG, it doesn't exactly follow in the exact same footsteps as many of Square's past franchises, with the games incorporating more action and hack and slash elements into their gameplay. Pack on an exceptional OST, recognisable characters that are voiced by an all-star cast, and a whimsical but charming narrative and you've got a game series that performed exceptionally well. With the immense success of the original game, it was only a matter of time before the series would expand exponentially, and that it did, with countless sequels, remasters, spin-offs and remakes that have continuously been released to this day. The franchise has shipped over 36 million units, making it one of the best-selling RPG franchises in history. It is without a doubt a Square Enix flagship. Magic Pengo, the quest for colour, or as we true fans like to call it, Karakuta, Meisaku, Kekiko, Rakugaki, Okoku. Okay, who am I kidding? I have no idea what this franchise is. Or at least I hadn't heard of it before making this video. And even after doing some research on it, I still just don't really know how to talk about this game. I'd say it's like a mix between Pokemon and Mario Paint, if you can imagine that. You essentially paint your own creatures and depending on the amount of magic ink used and the limbs you attach to your creation, specific stats are given to it. You can then battle other people's custom designs as a means of training your creatures up. The battle mechanic is far more basic than in Pokemon though, and follows a rock paper scissors methodology. This game was followed up a few years later by a sequel titled Graffiti Kingdom, which kept most of what made the first game so unique. I'm honestly surprised to see this franchise never make it to the Nintendo DS or 3DS. In theory, it sounds like the perfect console for such a game, but alas, we most likely won't be seeing it, as the franchise hasn't seen a new entry since 2003. Dungeon Siege was a series of action RPGs developed by gas-powered games. Set in the medieval kingdom of Ebb and not Flo, players would fight their way through a large linear world that was split up not by levels but by load screens. These games played similarly to the Diablo franchise in a sense, but unlike Diablo the games didn't work on the basis of different classes. Instead, players would become more proficient and skilled with weapons or magic abilities that they used often, meaning that in theory any character would be able to fill any role. Following the commercial success of the original, which went on to sell over 1.7 million copies, the franchise expanded to include a further two sequels as well as multiple expansions and a PSP spin-off. The popularity of the franchise would also lead to the creation of a movie titled In the Name of the King, A Dungeon Siege, which was said to be inspired by the original game. I'm gonna cut straight to the chase. It was terrible. The movie completely flopped in the same vein as Final Fantasy's film. Against all odds though, this film was followed up by two home video sequels. At this point, the film franchise was more consistent than the gaming franchise, and when I say I wished it stayed that way, I mean it. It would certainly be the lesser of two evils. See, Dungeon Siege has actually been revived to some extent, with Square Enix announcing its partnership with The Sandbox, in which they attained a patch of land that they themed around Dungeon Siege. Thing is, this isn't really a game, and more of a cash grab, as players would have to purchase pieces of land as digital NFTs. Yeah. Honestly, looking at this map, the only fun I could see coming out of it is playing maybe I Spy on it. I mean, I don't even know where Square Enix's patch of land is. I mean, you guys can pause and have a look if you want. Now, if you're thinking this place is Dungeon Siege back up in the It Exist tier, then you're solely mistaken. If anything, this drops it straight into the Dead tier. This kind of move is unacceptable, and I feel for the fans of the series that were probably excited hearing that the franchise they loved could return just to see this. We go from one end of the spectrum to the other with Conflict, another series of games developed by a subsidiary of a subsidiary. These were your typical tactical shooter games that players enlist in one of two squads. Each player in these squads had their own unique specialty. You'd have a demolition guy, a sniper elite, an assault rifle vet, and so on. And to succeed in these games, you'd have to use each of their specialties to your advantage. Despite its mediocre reviews, the game would sell extremely well, shipping over 2 million copies by the end of 2003. This would lead to a further 4 sequels ending with Conflict Denied Ops in 2008. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we'll be seeing a new entry, as the developer of these games, Pivotal Games, closed down following Denied Ops in 2008. It most definitely seems like a dead franchise at this point. Now I'm going to show you guys two characters, and it's up to you to figure out which franchise each one belongs to. So here's the first one, and here's the second. Alright, got your answers in? Well the first one is from a franchise called Drakengard, whereas the second image is from a franchise called Drakengard. Yes, I tricked you, they're from the same franchise. In fact, the Nier series of games is actually a spin-off based on the last of Drakengard's five possible endings. The franchise began all the way back in 2003, with Drakengard an action RPG that featured three types of gameplay, 
ground missions, aerial missions, and a free expedition mode. It may look bare bones by today's stands, but this game laid the groundwork for the rest of the games in this franchise. The Mainline Dragon Guard franchise would end up receiving three games to its name, with the latest taking us back to 2013 with Dragon Guard 3. During the long wait between Dragon Guard 2 and Dragon Guard 3, fans of the franchise were introduced to a somewhat new entry simply titled Nier. Now Nier did some interesting things, mainly drawing elements from a multitude of other game genres. In some instances, players would find themselves working through a 2D environment while platforming, while in other instances the camera would pull up to simulate that of a top-down shooter map. These interesting additions resulted in the game receiving a fairly mixed response though, but despite that the game sold decently well, shipping over 500,000 copies. Both Drakengard and the original Nier were long considered popular in Japan, but for the most part remained fairly unknown outside of Japan. At least that was the case, until the release of one game in particular. Like many I'm sure, Nier Automata was my first peer into this franchise, and honestly it's definitely not a bad place to start. This game was sublime. I sunk so many hours into this game, and despite it taking place in a post-apocalyptic world that was said to be barren, I somehow spent hours just wandering around and exploring the world. But the story, the multiple endings, and the music, my god, the music. All of these things just shot this particular game to worldwide stardom, and really opened up this franchise entirely. Nier would then get its very own remaster called, um, okay I'm not reading those numbers, but it performed significantly better than the original, selling much more. When it comes to the future of this franchise, there isn't too much information out there. However, I did find a statement from IGN which said a Square Enix producer named Yosuke Saito mentioned that as long as Nier creator Yoko Taro lives, a new entry is all but guaranteed. I guess we'll just have to wait and see if that's the case. I honestly believe that Nier Automata essentially kicked Drakengard from an it exist here franchise up to a mainstay franchise. We exit out of one post-apocalyptic world into another. Get it? God, my puns have to be some of the worst things ever. Now I'm definitely reaching here calling this series of games a post-apocalyptic venture. In reality, you play as Mr. Escape. Yes, what a whimsical play on words, but he lives up to that name as he must escape out of hospitals, facilities, offices, uh, this segment of the video, whatever you can think of, this guy was escaping from it. There's only one problem though, this guy also had the worst luck imaginable. This guy had to avoid fires, earthquakes, floods, bloody meteor storms, like what? And, and if that wasn't stressful enough, sometimes you had to help out others that are stuck and escape with them as well. The goal is to strategize a route that will help not only Mr. Escape, but also the stuck individual. To add to the difficulty, there are multiple types of individuals, like children, patients, and adults, who each have their own strengths and weaknesses one must consider when planning your escape route. Now while the game sounds interesting in design and concept, the actual implementation and gameplay didn't quite match up. Many found the platforming elements to be annoying and unwarranted, with many considering the deaths to such things as cheap gimmicks to add artificial difficulty. It did garner enough attention to warrant a sequel which was released a few years later in 2009, but following Exit 2 the franchise seemingly exited the market for good, letting us slot it into the dead tier. We've arrived at Square Enix's most successful franchise. That isn't an RPG. Just Cause was the birth child of Avalanche Studios under Eidos Interactive. And while it's described as a third person action adventure game, I've always considered them more like sandbox games. But maybe that's because I've only played Just Cause 2, which, I mean, it is a sandbox, but <laughs> each entry takes place on its own fictional island nation that you're free to explore. You can do this by any means you want. You can run around, fight whoever you want, pilot helicopters, planes, drive vehicles, as well as more extreme things like parasailing and even skydiving. The games for the most part were received extremely well, with Just Cause 2 in particular shipping well over 6 million units. I can't comment too much on the story of these games because like I said, I just played them like sandboxes where I just run around doing whatever I wanted. The series as a whole has shipped over 15 million units, making it one of Square Enix's most successful franchises. Each new entry tends to take a few years to release, but the series has continuously pumped out new games to this day. The most recent game, Just Cause 4, was unfortunately met with mediocre reviews and as stated by Square Enix themselves, didn't even break even on its production costs. From here, the franchise looked to expand to include a mobile release, which was set to release in 2022. This would inevitably end up being cancelled in July of 2023 though, leaving the future of this franchise in limbo. Even so, I don't believe this franchise will stop anytime soon. Maybe if the next few games are total flops as well, but overall this franchise is far too successful to be anything but a mainstay at this point. 
Now this next franchise, Battle Stations, was essentially an experimental franchise that had been worked on by Eidos Hungary, a subdivision of Eidos Interactive. Set during World War II, these games combined action and real-time tactics as players were able to not only command their fleet assets but also control them at any time they wished. While the games were received well, Square Enix would end up shutting down Eidos Hungary in 2009 due to the discontinuation of this particular franchise. CEO of Square Enix Europe, Phil Rogers, went on to say that the reason they did this was because they realised that to be first or the best in the RTS genre was going to be extremely challenging, and it wasn't necessarily something they were up to. This confirms that Battle Stations is without a doubt a dead franchise. Now despite that quote I just read out, the next franchise on this list, Supreme Commander, was another RTS game. But in Square Enix's defense, this one wasn't developed by them, rather it was created by Gas Powered Games, the same people who had handled the Dungeon Siege series. One of the coolest aspects of Supreme Commander was the fact that units were built to scale, such that small units would appear tiny on the field, whereas massive experimental units like the Cybrand Monkey Lord towered over units, so much so that even the simple act of stepping on top of smaller units would completely destroy them. The game's title comes from the fact that each base is built around a giant bipedal mech called an Armoured Command Unit. The general concept and gameplay follow that of your typical RTS games. You can choose between three separate factions, where your goal is to build up your base and army and conquer the other factions on the field. Now Supreme Commander was hyped up well before it even released, and it certainly lived up to it, garnering very positive reviews once it released. The franchise saw the release of a further sequel in 2010 with Supreme Commander 2, as well as an expansion pack titled Supreme Commander Forged Alliance. At this stage, the future of the franchise looked bright, but following the shutdown of the multiplayer servers in 2012, it was up to the community to salvage the rest. And that's exactly what they did. Using a server emulator, a multiplayer client was created by the Forged Alliance Forever community, and amazingly they've kept this up to this day. With an ever-growing player base and continued participation in community-hosted tournaments, it's nice to see that not all hope has been lost for this franchise. In saying this, it's hard to say that this equates to the franchise existing, as it's pretty clear to me that Square Enix at least doesn't seem to have any interest in continuing the franchise. The ones behind the Forged Alliance Forever have actually been working on an independent spiritual successor titled Sanctuary Shattered Sun, and while it doesn't have a specified release date, it's most likely the closest we'll get to a Supreme Commander 3. I guess if I take all of this into account, it can sit in the It Exists tier. Either that or the dead, it's one or the other. And the award for the most complex battle system goes to... The world ends with you. Honestly, what, what even is this? I didn't realise I needed a degree in neuroscience to understand what the hell is going on in this game. Now despite my saying this, once mastered, this combat system becomes one of the most fulfilling in any RPG ever. And it's one of the most unique and fun experiences to tap into. Essentially, the player had to manage two fights at once. These were against the same enemies, but the gameplay involved was different between them. Now I'm going to try and simplify this so that those who haven't played the game can understand what I'm trying to say here. Essentially, when you're controlling Neku, who's the main protagonist, you use what are known as pins. Each one of these had a different ability attached to it, and the means in which they were activated were different. Some required you to tap them quickly to activate, others would require you to slash over enemies to activate them, and some grander ones even had you shouting into the microphone. On the other hand, your partner character would be controlled by the face buttons, with each of them having their own card game based mechanic. I'm probably not doing a very good job at explaining all this, but as you can imagine this made for some extremely hectic gameplay. The game was met with critical acclaim upon its release, but sold poorly in comparison to a lot of Square Enix's other RPG franchises. This kind of halted any progress towards a sequel, as Square Enix wasn't sure if it was profitable enough to warrant one. They did release enhanced ports throughout the years, but following a decade with no news, many believed it to be a one-hit wonder. And this continued to hold true for the next few years, until 2020, where a week-long countdown started on the game's official webpage. The final countdown would end with the reveal of a brand new sequel titled Neo The World Ends With You, which would go on to be released in 2021. Now sporting a full 3D style, the sequel took a lot of what made its predecessor good and fleshed them out more. The game would garner positive reviews, but unfortunately sales numbers weren't up to scratch once again, with Square Enix themselves stating that it failed to meet their expectations. Now what this means for the future of the franchise, only Square Enix knows, but for now this deserves to sit in the It Exists tier. Now among the plethora of RPG titles offered by Square Enix, you can always count on Eidos to supply something slightly different, and this time that was Kane and Lynch. These were a set of third-person shooters that followed titular characters Kane and Lynch, who were a duo of hired mercenaries. 
There isn't too much to say about these games unfortunately, they failed to stand out from the crowd and received very average review scores across the board. Eidos would go on to announce that a sequel titled Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days was scheduled for release in 2010. While it also received average reviews, most considered it a slight improvement over its predecessor. Despite both games having sold over 1 million copies each, it seems as though the franchise has been abandoned. There were talks about a film adaption that was in the works from Lionsgate, and it was originally slated for a 2011 release, but later got pushed back to 2013, only to be silently axed while no one else was looking. All of these problems point towards the franchise dying out completely, and even if there was a slight chance of it coming back, those odds get lower and lower each day. Aww, what a cute game. Oh, hey, sorry. Didn't see you there. What's this you ask? Oh, it's just Mini Ninjas, the coziest ninja game in existence. Now some of you may be looking at this gameplay and wondering how the hell is a ninja cutting up enemies cozy? What about this? In the developer's mind, their ideas when creating this game was to make one that they could play with their kids. Now tell me that isn't wholesome as fuck. Mini Ninjas was a third person action adventure game where players got to pick one of six playable ninjas, each with their own unique set of abilities and weapons, as they fought their way through the world trying to restore peace. Its cute and cartoonish art style gave off its own charm, and while the game didn't necessarily blow anyone away, it did do enough to receive a few spin-offs as well as its own animated series which aired in 2015 on various networks. As this game seemed almost like a small title release, I can't see it coming back anytime soon. The most likely instance is another mobile game, but even then I can't see it happening at least for a little while. Chaos Rings is an interesting franchise. While it takes on the moniker of a Square Enix RPG series, they were primarily designed and released on mobile devices. The series is made up of four games, released from 2010 to 2014. They played like your typical RPG title where you moved your way through separate dungeons and landscapes. Honestly, for a mobile title, the graphics were very impressive and the gameplay, while simplistic, was addictive enough to the point where you'd spend hours laying around playing this without even realising it. The games would be downloaded over 1 million times before being removed from both Android and Apple app stores in 2016. The original Chaos Ring as well as Chaos Ring 3 would eventually get ports to the PS Vita, somewhat preserving the franchise, but in the case of Chaos Rings 2, it was looking like a lost cause. At least it would have been if the community didn't come to the rescue once again. In order to preserve these highly ambitious and original titles, the community managed to use offline prepackaged emulators that ran compatible versions of Android on PC. Even more impressively, in 2022, the PlayStation Vita emulator Vita 3K achieved playable status on all four Chaos Ring games, meaning that should you ever want to go and have a run through these games, you can now. Now while this is great and all for the preservation of the series, it doesn't change the fact that in Square Enix's eyes, this is most likely a dead or zombie tier franchise. Now I'd be surprised if many knew about this next franchise, Million Arthur. I'd personally never heard of it before making this video and that's partly due to the fact that the majority of these games have remained Japanese exclusives. The franchise itself has expanded to include far more than just video games, with whole animated TV shows, manga series, and even a live action adaptation. The original game was an online free to play card battle game and to this day remains one of the few instances where this franchise was made available in the West. Trying to explain what this franchise is about, however, is far more complex, as each new entry seemingly switched genres, such that this franchise has a VR game, an arcade game, an MMORPG, and finally an action RPG. From what I can see, this franchise loosely centres around the legend of King Arthur and the legendary sword Excalibur. Outside of that though, I couldn't tell you the first thing about these games. The fact that they've released so many games for it though, with one even being announced as recently as this year, means that even though it's not well known in the West, it does have a place in the it exists here at least. As the famous saying goes, don't fix what's not broken, and Square Enix plus RPGs definitely isn't broken. If they release an RPG, even if it's completely new IP, the chances it'll do well are always going to be high, and the Bravely franchise continues to prove that theory. Originally slated to be part of the Final Fantasy franchise as a sequel to Final Fantasy The Four Heroes of Light, series producer Tomoya Asano wanted to try out something new. So he went on to create Bravely Default, a fresh new RPG series for Square Enix. They've never done that before. All joking aside though, Bravely Default, like many of Square Enix's main RPG series, had a few things that helped differentiate itself from the crowd. While the game used a turn-based combat system, it now featured two new features fittingly named Brave and Default. Brave points essentially measured the number of actions that were possible each turn. These could go into the negatives, but would need to be at least zero for the player's characters to act. Brave points would accumulate at a rate of one per turn, and that's where the default option comes into play. Default would allow characters to enter a guard state, where they would take reduced damage as well as accumulate additional brave points. 
There are other things like sleep points that could be used to freeze time and whatnot, but the main combat flow centered around the Brave and default options. Upon its release, Bravely Default was met with critical acclaim. It would also sell extremely well, shipping over 1 million copies worldwide. Its success led to a further two sequels, both of which have been received well and sold incredibly well for such a new IP. Following the continued success of the franchise, series producer Tomoya Asano mentioned in 2021 that further entries into the series were almost guaranteed, although they would most likely take a further 3 to 4 years to develop. Now it should be noted that in this he said entries, and not entry, meaning that it's likely that this series will continue for a while longer with multiple new releases. Hearing this, I think it may have even earned a spot up in the mainstays. Life sure is strange, isn't it? If you told me 12 months ago that I'd be sitting in my room, recording that stupid pun of a line for a YouTube video, I'd tell you there's no way that I'd make such a lame joke. Yet here we are. In a similar sense, if you told me 15 years ago that Square Enix would make a series of narrative-driven adventure games, I'd also probably tell you there was no way they'd end up doing that either. But again, here we are. The Life is Strange franchise was built on top of developer Dontnod's Entertainment's previous 2013 game Remember Me, which briefly explored a mechanic where players could rewind time. This then went on to become the central mechanic in the first Life is Strange entry, with players being able to rewind conversations between characters to explore the branching dialogue options and shift the outcome of them. Every new entry into the series would introduce a new main character that had their own specific ability. Chloe in Before the Storm could use her backtalk ability to intimidate and persuade other characters. In Life is Strange 2, players must guide Daniel, who has the power of telekinesis through various moral and ethical choices. The franchise as a whole had released four mainline games, as well as a few remasters and demos. For a franchise that has only been out for eight years, this is a pretty impressive showing of development speed, and for the most part, the franchise has been received well, selling over 7.5 million copies between its games. Now despite it being a relatively new IP, I think it's worked its way up to the point where it can be considered a mainstay. Now these next few games aren't necessarily their own franchise, more so a series of games by one developer in particular, that being Tokyo RPG Factory, and yes, you guessed it, they specialise in developing, well, RPGs. But not just any RPGs, see this small team looked did focus on developing games inspired by titles from the golden age of RPGs. Games like Chrono Trigger and the early entries of Final Fantasy were heavily drawn from. The three games they went on to develop would each adopt a unique theme. I Am Setsuna, their first release, would adopt a snow theme while focusing its narrative on sadness. Their follow-up game would be Lost Sphere, which took on the theme of the moon while focusing its story and gameplay around memories. And the final and most recent release, Oninaki, would use the visual theme of flowers and on the Tokita's guidance would focus more so on mature themes that centered around death and the concept of reincarnation. Now, while these games were received decently well, they weren't what you'd consider smash hits, selling a decent but humble number of copies each. Even so, Tokyo RPG Factory would immediately start work and pre-production on a fourth title, which to this day still hasn't been revealed to us. Like I said, I don't think these are considered part of the same franchise and are more spiritual successes of each other, with their own standalone stories. I thought they at least deserved a mention though. And here is where we witness the birth of a new graphical style, fittingly named HD2D. And the game to introduce us to this visually appealing aesthetic was Octopath Traveler. This game essentially started off a whole new trend with Square Enix titles. And seemingly out of nowhere, they were pumping games like Triangle Strategy and Live Alive, so much so that I wouldn't blame you if you got confused as to which one was which. I definitely have. Now outside of its stunning graphical style, Octopath Traveler was at its core an RPG game. It had players pick one of eight characters, each of whom began their journey in different parts of the world. The game also uses its unique turn-based battle system which centers around the break and boost feature. Essentially all enemies came with a specific number of shield points. These are not shown to the players the first time around, but should the player hit an enemy with an attack they were weak to more times than they had shield points, they would break the enemy's defenses causing them to lose their turn. During their turn, players could exchange up to three of these to unleash a flurry of attacks or increase the potency of an ability. These types of features add some much needed depth and strategy to the turn-based battle system and were heavily praised alongside the game's graphics. Upon its release, the series was a commercial success, often being referred to as the magical RPG that the Nintendo Switch desperately needed. The game would go on to sell over 3 million copies, making it one of Square Enix's most successful recent releases. The franchise's second entry, Octopath Traveler 2, was more of the same, with a few added quality of life updates and general polish. The game would also sell extremely well, selling over 1 million units by June of 2023. At this point, I think this is a guaranteed mainstay. Based on how often this new HD2D style is used, and the popularity of the games themselves, I wouldn't be surprised to see numerous entries release over the next decade for this franchise. 
Now Voice of Cards, not to be confused with The Heart of the Cards, takes the spot as Square Enix's latest franchise. The trilogy first came into existence with the release of its first game, Voice of Cards The Isle Dragon Roars. The game's narrative, exploration and even battles were all represented in an artistic style using cards. Players could uncover parts of the map by flipping these cards over, which would also sometimes trigger random events or treasure chests. For a set of small scale console titles, this trilogy was very positively received. Both The Forsaken Maiden and The Beast of Burden released soon after the original, as well as a bundle that included all three titles packaged into one. As the series was originally planned to be a trilogy, you could say that this is a finished franchise. Looking at how well received the games were, I wouldn't be surprised to see a continuation at some point. For now, I will just place it in the It Exists tier. And there you have it. That is the current state of every Square Enix franchise. The biggest thing I took away from this video was the fact that Square Enix, while known as this JRPG juggernaut, does in fact have quite a few franchises outside the genre, most of which I'd say are decently ambitious and unique and probably worth checking out if they suit your preferences. The company as a whole has done a pretty good job of keeping even some of their oldest franchises afloat, with most of their recent revivals happening in the last few years. Once again, feel free to grill me on any franchises that I missed. I wish I could spend more time talking about certain franchises, but when it comes to RPGs, it's almost impossible to talk about them in a timely manner without starting to ramble for hours on end. Even so, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please do consider subscribing and all those things. I hope to see you all in the next video.